Good evening. Welcome to the December 10th, 2018 uh, regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. The first item tonight will be the administration of the oath of office for elected officials elected on November 6, 2018. And with that, I will turn it over to the town clerk. Thank you very much, Councillor Starr. We're going to begin with the um, oaths of Councillors elect Valerie Devereaux and Jeremy Gabrielson and Councillor Jamie Garvin. And that will be followed by uh, the oaths of office for school board elect Laura Danino and school board members Heather Altenberg and Elizabeth Seifries. Thank you to the town clerk and congratulations to all of the newly elected officials. And moving on, can we please have the roll call? Councillor Devereaux? Here. Councillor Gabrielson? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Randall? Here. And Councillor Straw? Here. Thank you. Will everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, moving on. Uh, the first item on the agenda for this evening is item number 1-2019, election of the town council chairman. The town council met in caucus last month and recommended Councillor Jamie Garvin as chairman and I'm looking for a motion. Uh, Councillor Jordan? Oh. Yep. I would move that uh, Jamie Garvin uh, be appointed chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Second. The second from Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Uh, any discussion? All right, uh, seeing none, all those in favor? And those opposed, it is unanimous. And with that, congratulations, Chairman Garvin. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll echo in Chris's um, uh, recognition and appreciation uh, for all of the newly elected officers, and thank you, Deb, for, um, for your work tonight. Uh, next up is uh, correspondence and reports. Do any councillors have any reports or correspondence to report? Okay. Go ahead, Penny. Um, I know that this is an item on the agenda tonight, but I, I think that um, all of the work that's been put in on the uh, comprehensive plan over the last uh, two years, it seems like 10, but it, it was only a couple of years. It's been extraordinary, and the amount of um, public input has been, I think, uh, more than in the past. But I hope that as we go through the process of bringing the plan to uh, approval that people will continue to be involved and engaged because it's such an important part of what we do and how we plan for our future. So uh, I know that we're going to talk about it later on, but uh, stay tuned and stay engaged. Thank you. Any questions for Penny? Any other reports or correspondence? I will add that um, Councilor Devereaux and I are both um, uh, participating in the Facilities Needs Assessment Committee that's a joint committee with the uh, school board uh, as well as some uh, parents and non-parents and other um, members of the community. We've met three times now and have one more meeting coming up um, right after the first of the year in the first week of January. Um, the materials are all uh, very thorough and have been chronicled on the website. There's a link um, in the hot topic section on the front page of the website. If anybody hasn't been able to attend meetings and is interested in following the progress on this, there's a lot of great detail uh, that's been put together. Uh, the public is welcome to come to the the uh, last scheduled meeting, which is, like I said, uh, the first week of January, and be part of that process as it continues to unfold uh, as we move into budget season. So just wanted to make that uh, known to everybody. Any questions? Seeing none. Um, our uh, next item is a presentation from the CEO of EcoMain, Kevin Roach, who's here with us tonight. Thank you for being here, Kevin. Um, so Kevin's going to talk to us, uh, and we, we also have a link to the annual report that's part of our packet tonight, um, but just talk to us about the goings-on at EcoMain these days, and I'm sure as many of you have either seen or heard um, Matt or I report on um, some of the um, variability and challenges in the recycling markets. Kevin's going to expand upon that quite a bit, I'm sure. And and uh, tell us what's going on over there. So thanks for being here, Kevin. Good to see you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I appreciate the support um, and, and the engagement from both the town manager and Councillor uh, Garvin <coughs> at EcoMain. Um, very, very helpful to have uh, that engagement and support. And also, I see some familiar faces, um, former um, board members, um, Penelope Jordan and Caitlin Jordan. Um, nice to see you again. So um, this, this slide um, is actually the cover of our um, annual report this year, and I really like this picture because um, this family came to our open house and, the first, and, 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 and picked up one of our um, recycling bins, and she put it right over her head and, and, and walked, walked on. So I thought it was a great picture and snapshot at what I'm going to uh, present to you today. Um, for those of you who may not be uh, as familiar with EcoMaine, I think our mission describes us best. EcoMaine provides comprehensive, long-term solid waste solutions in a safe, environmentally responsible, economically sound manner, and is a leader in raising public awareness of sustainable waste management strategies. And I think it's that last piece of the um, of, of the mission statement that really sets us apart from others. We're na nationally known um, across the country. People know who EcoMaine is um, because because of the work that uh, our communities are able to do. We subscribe wholeheartedly to the waste hierarchy, which is not only in main state statute, but is also guidance from the EPA, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle first, that's at the top of the hierarchy, then compost and digestion, then waste to energy, and then the very bottom rung, if there are no other avenues for that waste, um, landfilling it would be the only option left. 
We have 74 member communities, actually a couple of them in, in um, New Hampshire, but most of our communities are in, um, are in Maine, and 20 of those 74 are actually owner communities, and, and Cape Elizabeth included, is one of those owner member communities. So you can see we stretch all the way down to Na New Hampshire, all the way up to mid-coast and, and up into central Maine as well. Our facilities, we have a single sort recycling facility that we own and operate, um, about a two-year-old food waste recovery um, program, waste to energy facility, a landfill, and of course our programs, which I'll get into um, in greater detail in just a moment. Have you ever wondered what happened to that uh, bag, that half-eaten bag of stale Ruffles potato chips that you might have thrown away 30 years ago? Or how about the newspapers from 44 years ago, sitting in a landfill someplace? What's happening with, with those newspapers? Well, we wanted to find out, so we dug deep into our landfill, <coughs> went back 44 years to find out what was happening before we had waste to energy. And we found some interesting things. <laughs> One of the things that I wish I would have kept was this cassette tape um, of Purple Rain, Prince and the Re Revolution. <laughs> But what we, what we found was that not everything um, degradates at the same pace. Um, yes, there is degradation in the landfill. Landfills are one of the largest contributor, contributors of, of methane gas. Um, but not everything um, does disintegrate uh, with, with in, over time it will. Um, but a 44-year-old newspaper where you could read each and every word, that was amazing to us, um, that we could find out what was happening 44 years ago. So landfill storage is really a forever proposition, and this is a, a landfill, now the largest landfill. Um, it's just outside of Syracuse in Seneca Falls, New York. It's called Seneca Meadows, and, uh, and this picture was taken in the Walmart parking lot, which sits right next to the landfill. And um, to, to me, this is a forever situation there that they are going to have to live with that mountain of trash, and it is a huge mountain and getting bigger. And you can see the semis coming all over the Northeast, including um, Eastern Massachusetts and of course New York. They line up, they queue up, and all those um, tractor trailer uh, loads of trash basically um, are destined for, for that landfill and it is there forever. And that's something that I think we can all agree that nobody wants in their back backyard. Um, do you remember from years past, um, Mobro, the barge, Mobro? Um, you may in a moment, but um, Mobro, and you can, you can, there's a nice video that I had on here, but you can um, Google the YouTube too, but Mobro was the gar barge from 30 years ago, and, and it was the, um, from, from Islip, New York, um, they decided that, well, let's try exporting our garbage someplace. They didn't know where someplace was, but they loaded up this barge full of 3,500 tons of, of uh, bale trash, and set sail. So it uh, started in New York and then they went down. They thought they had a home in North Carolina and when the media got a hold of that, they turned them away. Um, they went down to Florida, um, tried to offload in Louisiana, um, and the governor there stopped uh, that from happening. It, set, it sailed around the Gulf of Mexico um, and then um, up into, the, um, uh, into Mexico and then back finally to New York. So it was, set, it was at sale for seven months this garbage barge, and um, the, the seagulls had a feast at it, so they dropped little bits on, on, on everybody, I think. Um, but um, the message there was, next time, try recycling. And that was really the beginning of the recycling movement. It was also the beginning of the movement of waste to energy, that, that there had to be a better way of dealing with this waste. So recycling um, really was, you know, began back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, um, and the waste energy facility, our waste energy facility, was built actually in 1988. Um, this waste, this 3,500 tons, when it returned to New York, was actually processed at a waste energy facility. So we've come, we've come a long way, and recycling has been extremely successful. I've been in the business for almost 30 years and have seen tremendous growth in, in basically all of recycling. Um, so we've had a pretty good run, and um, this, uh, this past year has been the toughest year that I've seen. Um, 
mostly on the paper side and a little bit on the plastic side. We haven't had as much trouble with our plastic situation, but certainly recoverable paper has been a problem for us. This is a shot of a recycling plant in Denver where they've been stockpiling bales and bales of paper that they just can't sell. And we've, we've um, experienced similar circumstances, however, everything has moved to date. So earlier this year, I mean, you, may have, you may have heard some reports that we too had stockpiled bales of, of waste paper um, looking for a home. But you can see over time, I and mean, we've had a pretty good run over the last 10 years, and it's been fairly stable with the value of the recyclable materials hovering you know, around $80 to $100 a ton. Um, but this past year, it has just dropped to $15 a ton. And that has really ch challenged the recycling infrastructure, really not just here in Maine and not just in the United States or North America, but around the world. Um, and the question you know, comes, is or isn't quite a bit, as to why, why did this happen? Well, first and for foremost, um, supply and demand was thrown out of balance um, because China stopped the importation of, they were the largest importer of recycled materials, both plastic um, and, and paper materials. And they began to ban those materials from coming into their country last year. I'll get to more on that in just a moment. But also, too, when you think about it, think about newspapers 10 years ago. Everybody subscribed 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and now so few of us um, still subscribe. Um, and there's just so little newspaper. It's amazing to me, working in this industry, how the, um, the characteristics of the materials have changed. And when you look for newspapers today, you actually have to look really hard. And it's mostly the weeklies, you know, the smaller papers that that are coming in, um, and if you do subscribe, they're really, really small papers, and oftentimes they're quite thin as well. So in the digital age, um, that is something that we've, we've had to deal with. And then also contamination. Over the years, um, we've become more and more tolerant, um, mostly because the markets were tolerant to contamination. And so we were toler tolerant as a processor of uh, higher and higher levels of contamination. You notice, too, that I put contamination in red because we can't control um, the supply and demand, and we certainly can't control China's ban on importation of, of scrap materials. We can't control what's happened to newspapers. The only thing that we can control in our communities is contamination, and, and so we have addressed that, and contamination has actually improved. You know, just 10 years ago, all of our paper was, was sold right here in the state of Maine to, to mills who took that paper and recycled it. Um, but when the newspaper um, industry began to fall apart, um, China was one of the few markets that was left there standing um, that graciously took the material. And in fact, not only did they take the material, they took it at premiums um, or values that we had never seen before. Um, so really, you know, although the newspaper uh, markets died, um, we, we ended up, financially speaking, being in pretty good shape because China was, was very, very aggressive in, in uh, picking up the pieces there. One of the reasons being is because they were shipping our, all their products um, to, our, to North America, and so they had really cheap freight going back. So, uh, you know, we took advantage of, of that cheap freight. But over the last year, China has put this ban on scrap imports, which they called the national sword. And this quote really, really stuck with me. Um, it may, the ban, result in chaos in society, which it has. Some voices that have been critical of Chinese policies are downplaying their own culpability or responsibility to adjust accordingly. And quite frankly, being in the industry, I couldn't agree more. I wondered how long this would last. How long would China be taking this material and allowing for higher and higher and higher levels of contamination? 20 years ago, contamination was below 5%. But as over the years went by, it grew to 15, 20, 30, 40 percent. But China was still buying the material. So really, there was, nobody was forced to clean up the material until now when they stopped buying the material. So you can see that you know, they went from buying material that was 20, 30 percent contaminated down to, over on the right-hand column there, 0.5 percent contamination, which the industry can't meet. In fact, the scrap circular is something that we, we live and die by. And, and the, the contamination levels in there have been consistent for 30 years since I've been working in the industry at about 5%. 
because post-consumer material is going to contain, it can't be perfect, it is going to contain some level of contamination, and that has always been at, you know, basically averaged about, about 5%. So these are two pictures which I can include. I know they're a little bit hard to see, but it gives you a sense for um, the one on the, the, the red uh, graph there shows um, that the G7 countries are really responsible for more than half of the exports um, and of, of um, plastic. And then over on the right-hand side of paper materials, three quarters of the exports are from G7 countries. So, um, and then where are they going? And you can see on the left-hand side is in 2017, and on the right-hand side is 2018. And I think the, the takeaway here is China was the largest importer, and you can see they've almost cut their imports in half, and it's, it's, it's even moving in, in a faster direction as we, as we move ahead. Now, some of the pieces have been picked up by some other Asian countries, such as India. In fact, we have sent a lot of our, our, our scrap paper to India. Um, when the paper was that cheap, you know, when there was the value of the paper was so cheap, India basically decided to get back into the market. A lot of their mills had been shuttered. They were out of the market because China was paying the premiums. But when China stopped buying, India started, came back to the market, Vietnam, Indonesia, all these other countries. Um, showed some interest, but they didn't replace um, the amount or the volume that China was taking. So is China coming back? That's been the big question. A year ago, if you asked me, I would have been, I would have, I would have said, my answer would have been yes. Because every time China has come into the market and they've left the market, they come into the market, they've left the market, and every time paper gets cheap, they come back to the market. Um, but it's been a year now and they haven't come back to the market. Um, they really want to clean up the material that's coming into their country and, and really they don't want to deal with the world's waste. And 20, 30% of what was coming in was the world's waste. And so they were serious about it. They've, they've stopped buying. However, the mills, and this is, the, this is a governmental restriction, the mills, the industry in China still wants the paper. They, run, their mills are not running at full capacity. And so now we're beginning to hear, after a year now, um, from some of the industry experts in, in, in China, that they're interested in bringing <laughs> material back, perhaps in a different uh, form. And so Nine Dragons is a company, a, a Chinese company that has purchased four mills in the United States, two of them in Maine. So Rum the Rumford Mill has been purchased, and their plan there is to make recycled pulp. So the idea there is to bring in recycled material, which we now can't ship to China, but they still want the material, make a recycled pulp out of it, remove the contamination, and then ship the recycled pulp either back to China or to any other markets in the world. So that's the plan for Rumford. We're still a year or two out, but that's very promising. Particular for, particularly for um, the eco-main communities because that market is so close. A lot better than shipping it to Rumford than, than Indonesia and, and some of the other places, India and some of the other places that we're shipping it to. So we're seeing some signs of relief. Also, even in North America, we're seeing some interest domestically in developing markets for what's left in the paper recycling mix, which is this mixed paper, um, as opposed to years ago when it was news, most, no, mostly newspaper. But we're also seeing huge transition. Do you remember the days when you used to buy laundry detergent in powdered form in a box? And then that went away, and we went to the plastic, rigid plastic jugs, so we made markets for those. But now, the jugs are now being replaced by these pods or these packages and, and plastic packaging, which is non-recyclable. So that's been a huge challenge for the recycling industry, and you're seeing it right at, right at the store shelves. Um, pizza boxes now come in, pizza frozen pizzas now come in plastic casings. And then, you know, with um, Amazon and, and home delivery, 20 years ago, we didn't have cardboard at the, cur at, at the household um, because we didn't have the home delivery that we have, you know, that we have today. But now we're asking ourselves, have we reached peak cardboard because we're beginning to see home delivery now come in plastic bags and perhaps you're seeing that at your own home too. So with those things, um, with all those um, variables at play, you know, we're, we're watching um, because the, the material that's coming into us is really ever changing. But now contamination. Contamination comes in all forms. We get a lot of questions, well, you know, what does our town's contamination rate look like and what's in there? And it's really fairly consistent from town to town, to town to town, and it's a little bit of everything. Here's a picture of a straw and a, and a plastic cap. 
um, and, and paper and, and clothing and, and um, you know, sometimes animal carcasses. I mean, we get at bowling balls. We get everything in there. Some people are wish cycling. Some people are avoiding disposal. It's a little bit of everything. But with the coverage that we've had, um, with which bin should I put it in, and encouraging people to ask themselves before they put it in the recycling bin um, to really check to see if it is a recyclable materials. And when in doubt, um, there are t there are tools, including our recycle. They can go online um, to find out if it's a recyclable item or not. <clears throat> We're doing education in the schools. Almost, this is a great picture. This is at our waste energy plant. So there's a garbage truck right in line there with a school bus. Almost on a daily basis, we have tours coming through our facilities because those are the folks that become advocates for good solid waste management practices and, and policies going forward. So we're trying to get everybody we can um, either to come for a tour or come to one of our open houses because when they see it for themselves, um, they really pass on that information to others. I got this um, picture from Jamie Garvin. Um, this was our recycling as a work of art. So these containers get trucked all over the town and when they see this, I, well, our hope people will, will kind of recognize it and say, hmm, what that, what's that container all about, all about? And it has directions on how to recycle right, right on it. Um, recently, um, we've been to Pond Cove Elementary School and the Festival of Curiosity at the middle school. We're, we're, we're trying to be everywhere we possibly can, and if we haven't reached um, a place of interest to you, let us know. We have three educators that are out there that are really um, getting the message out on good recycling habits. Um, so we use earned media, paid media to reinforce tabling at events, count, town council presentations like this evening, um, open houses, school presentations, the recyclopedia, social media, and leadership. We need champions to help us to help us get the word out. We also are working on facility improvements, and you can't sort your way out of uh, the contamination problem. It, you know, we can we can clean up the material that's coming in. We can take material that's eight percent contaminated and get it down to five percent contaminated. We can't take material that's 30, 40 percent contaminated and and sort it because there's just not enough time in the day to keep up with the incoming material. But technology is improving, optical separation is improving, robotics separation is improving, so the, the, the industry is, is, is moving forward and, and um, providing tools for us to use to improve the quality of the material. I also wanted to mention that our food waste program is now two years old. This year we'll recover 5,000 tons of, of food waste. Um, much of that is coming from com the commercial side Sector, which would be grocery stores, restaurants, food service, cafeteria, that type of thing. Um, but we really have something we can be proud of in Maine, in Exeter, Maine, Exeter <coughs> Agri Energy, um, because this is a blueprint that to many other communities across North America has have been troubled um, to, to uh, sustain. Um, and the reason why they're able to uh, really be successful up there is because they use everything in the, in the, in the material that's coming in. So they take food waste and they take food waste in bags. So you're allowed to contain material. Most people like to contain their food waste in something because of the ick factor. They debag the material, they put it into their digester, they recover the energy, and then after they've recovered the energy, they take the liquid portion and apply it to fertilizer on their fields, and then they take the solids, dry that out, and they use it for animal bedding. And when the animal bedding's used up again, it goes right through the system again. So it's a little bit far away, but I couldn't convince them to move their 2,500 head of cows down to Portland, so we ended up having to ship our food waste um, up to Exeter, Maine. But it really is a success story, I think, that we have, that we can be proud of in Maine. So in summary, um, we are advocating for communities not to abandon their recycling programs. We're seeing this left and right, and I think it's really short-sighted. Um, you know, we're in this for the long haul, and recycling is just like any other market, it's gonna have its ups and downs. Very important that, uh, you know, we, we get through these down periods and then enjoy the up, up periods when, when they do um, come back. Our waste to energy facility has positioned us well. Um, recently, I had my counterpart from Rhode 
Rhode Island. Um, they're, they don't have a waste energy facility. They have a landfill. Their landfill is closing in 2024. And they don't know what they're going to do with their waste beyond there. And they were looking for avenues in Maine. They were also looking in av at avenues or, or solutions in Ohio. Can you imagine shipping waste from Rhode Island to Ohio? Um, not a position that we would want to be in. We're actually in pretty good balance. And it's because our waste to energy facility has prolonged the life of our landfill because we reduced the waste mass by 10%. So our landfill is really one-tenth of the size that it would have been because we too, had we not had the waste energy facility, we too would have been shipping our waste to faraway places. Um, we're building a new metals recovery facility um, that will recover non-ferrous metals from the ash. Um, this is a state-of-the-art facility. It will only be the third in the country to be built, so another thing that we're proud of. Um, and that will be built right at the landfill next year. Um, and we're, we're going to continue our growth and outreach. Last year we reached 25,000 people either toward our facilities or sat through a presentation such as this. And we want to continue that effort because when we make those personal touches, we feel that it has a real trickle-down effect. Um, we're going to continue our food waste recovery project. We're looking at regional collection for our member communities that have curbside collection. And then landfill diversion is, is something that we have to continue um, to uh, make sure that we have good policies going forward, both at the state level where we, we provide advocacy um, and legislation at the state level and at the federal level to develop better um, uh, best practices um, for dealing with solid waste going forward. So uh, I leave you with the slide with those Ruffles potato chips sitting in the landfill um, because it's really all about, this is what we want to avoid. We want to avoid storing this material in landfills because we feel that that is a forever um, proposition um, and for this, not only for the state of Maine but uh, for the country as well. So that is my remarks for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Very good information. Do any counselors have questions for Kevin or comments? Councilor Jordan. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things I constantly think about is I know we focused a lot on recycling and diversion and things like that over the years. I, uh, where the focus on um, reduce and how we get people focusing on not even having that item in order to put it into the recycle world or the diversion world. And I don't know what's going on in the industry to start educating people on the whole concept of not having it to begin with. Yep, and that's, that's a great comment. Um, and that really comes down to our educational component. And our educators are the ones, because yes, you're right, um, it, it's hard to teach reducing. Re reduce, reuse, and recycle. You know, reduce and reuse come before recycle. And that's what our edu educators are teaching, is yes, if you can reduce or you can reuse, that's a better option than, than even recycling is. So um, I think that um, I'd love to do more. Um, but I think that our educators are really focusing on the waste hierarchy, um, particularly with the uh, children in our communities, and letting them know that there are preferences <coughs> to recycling um, solid waste and recyclable materials. Good. Thanks. Sure. Other questions, comments? Um, I just wanted to add that um, the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Committee is doing a really, really tremendous job here in town of trying to um, advocate and be champions like Kevin was just talking about. If people are here uh, at the meeting or watching, um, they have a new Facebook page which you can follow. Um, the biggest thing that we can do right now in Cape is um, be very mindful of the contamination problem. Um, Matt and I and Bob Malley get reports uh, on a weekly basis from the staff over at Eco Maine about um, the amount of contamination that we're seeing and if people could really be, um, I think, more deliberate, more mindful about the material that they're putting in, uh, that will even help us out a lot as we go forward. And we've talked about for next year, um, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing some budget impact to some of these things coming down the pike. Um, the Board of Eco Maine authorized an increase in, in tipping fee that we'll be budgeting for for next year. Um, and, you know, if, if the contamination problem doesn't start to resolve itself, there could be other financial ramifications from that. So it's really, really important that the community, um, you know, gets very mindful, like I said, about, about what they're throwing into the, into the different streams there. So um, go ahead, Valerie. Do you think that part of the contamination problem is because it's not single sort, that everything is put in together? 
But some cities have where you sort out the glass, you sort out the plastic, you sort out the paper. Right, right. I get that question a lot, and we really had to combine the stream years ago because what was happening is when we started collecting, you know, 30 years ago in Rochester, New York, I started collecting newspapers. So then we added clear glass, and then we added brown glass, and then we added tin cans, and then we added mixed paper, and then we added magazines. And these trucks were turning into trains, and we were spending about two minutes per stop while the truck was running, two minutes per stop, loading all these materials into this train or trailer of, of keeping all these materials separated. So if we wanted to recycle more, we had to find a way to combine the materials because we couldn't afford keeping the routes out that long. And, um, and then the environmental impact of these trucks just sitting at the curb waiting to sort all this material. So we had to move to a, a, a program that combined the materials or commingled the materials together. So so we had no choice. Um, so in, in a perfect world, if you didn't have to include transportation, maybe that would be the case, but so often you do have to include transportation. So um, to some degree, yes, but I really, it, it, you also have to look at the materials changed with the news, newspaper drowned everything out years ago. And so really we don't have newspapers, so that variable is, isn't even available to us today. Um, so that's another thing. And then the, the tolerance, we tolerated it um, for so long and each year got a little bit worse until somebody, you know, yeah, I knew this had to stop. It was too, it was too easy. Um, and things that are too easy eventually come to an end. And it did come to an end. But I really do believe that we, we will get through this and, and we're already seeing, as was pointed out, um, improvement. So that's a positive sign. Great. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Kevin, thank you again for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate the presentation. Um, our next item is item number 2-2019, the confirmation of police chief. Matt, you want to introduce this item? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Just had to turn the uh, yeah, sorry about display that. off. <laughs> Tried to move. No, you were leaving on us. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very uh, proud this evening to, to be the sponsor for item number 2-2019. Uh, the, count, the town took under the, uh, well, I guess, let me start, uh, start over. The town has enjoyed uh, having the services of Chief Neil Williams for the better part of the past 40 years in different capacities. And uh, we had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to celebrate uh, Neil's tenure with the town. And uh, it was also a celebration at that point because uh, we undertook the interview process and, uh, and advertised for the replacement for Chief Williams. We had a great deal of interest. We ended up boiling down to six extremely strong candidates. We had in-house candidates as well as external candidates. And through the process, there was one who came through with shining, shining colors, head and shoulders above the others, and that's Sergeant Paul Fenton. And uh, Paul did a fantastic job throughout the, and throughout the interview process and was the unanimous choice of the assembled interview panel that, that I pulled together. Uh, I did have... Uh, uh, an additional chief, uh, Robbie, uh, Robbie Moulton from Scarborough was on, uh, was on the interview panel, as well as uh, former council chairman Ann swift and uh, as well as our uh, public works director Robert Malley and fire chief Peter Gleason. So uh, we had a great, great group who worked really hard, but Paul did a fantastic job, and that's why uh, he had our, our unanimous recommendation, and that's why it's here this evening uh, for action by the council. If you look at the charter, the chief of the police is an appointment that's made by the town manager. However, he also needs to be, he or she also has to be confirmed by the council. So uh, that's why I brought this here this evening. And uh, Sergeant Fenton, soon to be hopefully Chief Fenton, is here with us this evening as well, as well as <coughs> Chief Williams and uh, the additional officers as well. So, Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Um, before I look for a motion, uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? If we could have your name and address, please. Yes, it's uh, Jonathan Sarbeck, 60 Longfellow Drive. I'm actually here in two capacities. One as a, uh, a citizen of Cape Elizabeth who actually grew up here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Chief Williams for all his service uh, to the town uh, for his uh, long time that he's worked uh, as a chief. But I think that the uh, I would recommend the council make the decision uh, that's been uh, recommended by the town manager. I've known uh, first it was Officer Fenton, then it was Detective Fenton, and now it's Sergeant Fenton uh, for a long Long time since you joined the force in 1997, and the other capacity that I'm here for 
or here in is as a representative of the Cumberland County DA's office. I can tell you that Sergeant Fenton has uh, represented the town uh, through his work with the police department uh, and the DA's office with professionalism, uh, with integrity, and now hopefully with a lot of leadership. Uh, so from a citizen's perspective and from a member of the Cumberland County DA's office, I hope that you take the recommendation and confirm uh, Sergeant Fenton as the next uh, chief of police in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, I'll be looking for a motion to confirm the town manager's appointment of Paul W. Fenton to serve as police chief of the town of Cape Elizabeth, effective December 11th, 2018. Is there a motion? Councilor Jordan. Um, I would have it be ordered. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council confirms the town manager's appointment of Paul W. Fenton to serve as police chief of the town of Cape Elizabeth, effective December 11th, 2018. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Caitlin Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? And opposed? It's unanimous. Congratulations, Chief Fenton. You may have noticed why uh, uh, Chief Fenton will, will be a, uh, effective as of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He's uh, off the clock, but also <laughs> he'll be sworn in tomorrow morning at 8.30 by Deborah Lane. So if you'd like to come by to, to see the official swearing in ceremony, uh, that'd be great. So, uh, But just to, if you were wondering why it wasn't today, that, that's why. So Understood. Um, I'd also like to recognize the other officers that are here. Thank you for being here. And um, I'd like to extend my gratitude and thanks to outgoing Chief Williams as well and wish you all the best in, in your retirement. Uh, on behalf of everybody in town and me personally, I'm very grateful for all the work that you and your staff have done and uh, look forward to keeping in touch and hope you enjoy your, your uh, time away. So we know we'll be seeing you around. So thank you very much. Um, we'll move on in the agenda. We have the uh, Finance Committee report. Finance Chair Straw. Oh, I guess I'm now officially the Finance. Uh, so you all should have received the dashboard and the appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the revenue distribution for our new town councilors. Uh, we'll review this uh, at the beginning of each meeting each month. Um, basically, the documents that you'll see is the, we have some line items for the, the, the more detailed documents, and then the town manager, um, who I'll ask in a second, uh, will normally give us uh, the highlights from the dashboard, which summarizes kind of the mean uh, both revenue and expense categories. And with that, uh, I'd ask the town manager if he has anything he'd like to highlight in the dashboard. Thank you, Councilor Stry. I'd, I'd be happy to. A uh, couple of things. Uh, welcome to the email chain uh, from here on out every Thursday. Uh, both you and I and Jamie will receive the uh, uh, the warrants from uh, from the from our finance department. So you'll have those to review, and generally we'll approve those by, by midday so they can process checks. So uh, as of as of today, you'll be uh, jumped into the gang. So that's a good thing. A couple of uh, items to report from on the, uh, on the financial dashboard is uh, our excise taxes continue to show robust growth. We're tracking at almost half of where we need to be a month earlier than we should be there. So we're almost 49%. At this point last year, uh, we were at 45 and almost 45 and a half percent. So we're about 4% plus. Almost, almost, almost five percent above where we were at this point last year, which is a good thing. Uh, partly due to uh, higher ticket cars that are being purchased. Many of them are being purchased out of state, but the the excise taxes, as you know, if you've registered a newer vehicle, can be painful. But they also help the town's revenues. So uh, that that's a good area. The one area that I have of concern, and we'll be having a recommendation on next month's agenda, uh, is related to legal expenses. As you'll see, that we are at 99.97% expended, we're basically $26 below where we should be for the year. Uh, so I'm gonna, I have to speak with our current attorneys, uh, specifically regarding the paper streets issue. That's been the lion's share of our expenses there. And those, you know, those, those expenses do continue to, to be paid on a monthly basis. So I will come back with a recommendation to try to get us through to the end of the year. I spoke with the auditors today to, to discuss certain strategies we could use and ultimately I'll, I'll have a formal recommendation next month. Uh, we, that 
Uh, there's an opportunity here just to say that that process is continuing. Uh, they are still in discovery and will be through the month of, I think through the month of March is when the uh, discovery period would, will be ending. Uh, that'll be this month, I know both Maureen O'Mara, the town planner, and then next month I will be, both of us will be deposed as part of that. So the expenses still continue to, to come from that. So uh, we knew that going in and uh, tried to come up with the best uh, estimate as the budget was crafted last spring. Uh, however, we'll, I'll have a better recommendation, better recommendation next month. Other areas we were doing very well, uh, even with the early with the early snow that we did receive, we're still only at ten, per, almost ten and a half percent on the salt. Sand and salt, we're doing fairly well on, as well as over time, uh, we seem to be tracking below where we need to be at this point of year. So we're we are seeing some some cost savings there. So overall we're on track except in a couple of different areas and our revenues are doing doing well. You'll notice building permits still continue to, to reflect a robust building economy within the town, whereas we're at 73.2%, uh, <coughs> whereas last year we were, we were at 62, almost 63%. So things are still moving along, thank goodness. So, but that's, uh, that's what I have to report on that. Any questions for the town manager? With that, I'll return it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have an opportunity for citizens to speak on any items not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on an item not on tonight's agenda? Please come to the podium, give us your name and address. You have three minutes, please. My name is uh, Greg Gordon, I live at 110 Two Lakes Road, and I work, um, I grew up here in Cape Elizabeth and I also uh, live here now with our family as well. Um, I work with the cruise ships and that's uh, what I do for a full-time job. And we bring cruise ships guests um, to Portland and other parts of uh, Portland and beyond. Um, I'm here to recommend the town reconsider their motion from last month to implement a 300% increase um, up to $150 per motor coach that comes in. And it's something that we were under the impression it's gonna to go to $70 as we've been discussing with all of our contacts. And then at the last town council meeting and the previous workshop the day before, unbeknownst to me, and I was not aware of it, nor did I look at the um, correct documentation to see those being addressed, but I'd worked with our town connections that I was not advised of this particular situation of this increase. And it creates a hardship at one level of the sense that we do not budget for this. As you all know, budgeting is important. And we budget 18 months out, and we've been discussing this for years with uh, different groups as it comes along. We probably need to do a better job of communicating that in the future. So I'd like the town council to reconsider the rate increase from uh, $50 per bus up to 150 and reconsider it to be re-added as an additional item for the next town council meeting. I have more information if you want it, but I know I don't have much time. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda? Please come forward. Your name and address or affiliation, please. Um, my name is Charlotte Rosenthal. I'm a, I live on 457 Mitchell Road in Cape. And um, I'm here as a founding member of the Greater Portland Archangel Committee, um, to which the town is a, also a, a founding member. And um, I've been asked to present you with um, a certificate uh, for your contribution to uh, this exhibition that's now showing in Yarmouth um, of a Portland Photo Club, Archangel Photo Club uh, exhibit of, of, of photographs. Um, and you sponsored two particular photographs that, um, that are on the certificate, one American, one Russian. Um, You also get a, a plate. Um, that has um, all the towns that are members of the Archangel Committee um, and one American, one Russian photograph and our flags and, and, and so on. So. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And just, uh, just a couple of follow-up. Um, I would love to see the exhibit, um, perhaps in our library, uh, sometime next year. Um, the exhibit is going to various towns. It's right now in um, the historical center in, in uh, the Stonewall Gallery that's part of that center in Yarmouth. Um, and it's going to several other towns, but there will be opportunities next year to hang the photographs um, for a month in March or after um, June, July for a, a couple of months. So it'd be nice to have the exhibit here if possible. Um, and I have the information for who to contact about that if, if you want to follow up. Um, the other thing is that we are planning to send a group of high school students in April, vacation week of April of 2020. And that's being headed up by um, Westbrook High School. The principal there met with a, several principals from Archangel recently to talk about doing a student exchange. And again, because I live here, I'd love to see um, some of our students part of that. So um, it's just in the planning discussion s stages right now. But um, again, I'd, I'd like to see us participate. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you uh, information about who to contact with the photos. Thank you very much. Uh, Good my school Thank you. and my information is in there. All right. Thank you so much. See you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to receive this uh, on behalf of the town. And uh, if anyone wants to come over and check it out afterwards, uh, you're more than welcome to. And we'll find a place to hang on to that and display it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from citizens on agenda items, or on items not on tonight's agenda, rather? Um, I just want to address the point that uh, you made. Um, certainly, it's within the council's purview to um, uh, entertain action to reconsider. Uh, it's not on tonight's agenda. Uh, I don't know if we'll um, have some further discussion on that or not, but just in terms of managing expectations, um, you know, there may not be anything that happens on that this evening. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, your comments. Matt, did you want to speak on that any further? If I could, Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Gordon a couple weeks ago and it encouraged him to come and speak to the council uh, to express his thoughts. Uh, the one thing I would say is, uh, you, you should be fine. Council can set or council sets fees, so you don't actually have to have a motion to reconsider it to go back and change fees as you as you choose throughout the year. So uh, you have that opportunity. So it's not as as formal as it would have been if it was say perhaps a. Just about yeah. any other item on the <laughs> on the agenda. Quite frankly, that's one area that you have the the freedom to freedom of movement on. So, okay. but I did. I encouraged Mr. Gordon to come in this evening, and I uh, had a great uh, great meeting with him uh, a couple weeks ago, and he explained his perspectives on that, and then you know that he didn't. You know, he was remiss in the fact that he, he couldn't make it to the meeting that evening because he thought, based on the, the information going forward, that it was going to be one specific specific circumstance and. And there was a change, so that's why he came this evening, just to explain the background on that. Got it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for coming to express your views. Appreciate it. Um, if there are no other citizens wishing to speak on anything, we'll move to the town manager's monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In light of the size of this evening's agenda, I'll attempt to, brief, uh, to be brief in my remarks. I'd like to take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy holiday season. I'd also like to note that the town office and the town operations will be closed on Christmas Eve for the day, but the town will have normal hours on New Year's Eve. I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate the newly elected and re-elected council members. Looking forward to working with you all in the coming year and, uh, and setting the goals for the next year. Work continues to re to the on the request for proposals for pay and display parking at Fort Williams, and I'm collaborating with Jim Kearney on the for from the Fort Williams Park Committee on the finalizing the RFPs, which you should anticipate getting out shortly. Uh, we're on the home stretch with that. I met with local architect uh, Joseph Shalott on the Spurwing School reuse, and we'll be meeting with Jim Rowe next week and trying to move the subject uh, onward. 
The new winter slash spring programming brochure for community services is out on the street and there is a diverse amount of programming for all ages. Uh, so we have been able to expand our senior programming as well, which has been a uh, Lesser in the past, we are we we do have renewed uh, renewed energy in there. With Jane Anderson's doing a great job uh, programming, and finally the new ambulance was delivered this week. So that's exciting. That was one of our big ticket items that we had in this year's capital capital purchases. It has not been deployed yet because we do have some final equipment that needs to be installed as well as the new radios, but you should see that out on the streets shortly. So I know the chief's extremely excited about it as well as the rest of us. So uh, that is my manager's report this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Matt? Seeing none, uh, next item is review of the draft minutes of the November 14th meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as presented here? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Second. Yeah. Councilor Straw, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's unanimous. Um, I can sense the question, Councilor Devereaux and perhaps <laughs> Gableson. Um, uh, as an administrative function, even if you were not at the meeting, you are able to vote to approve the minutes, so. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, in our packet a link to the results of the caucus held on November 13th. The items that are gonna follow are um, the appointments of the various chairs and committee representatives. Uh, before I do that, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on the following agenda items, three through 16-2019? Seeing none, we'll move to uh, number three, dash 2019, the adoption of the town council rules. Is there a motion to adopt the town council rules as included in the agenda packet here? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Item number 4-2019, the appointment of finance committee. Uh, as was noted, the results of the caucus, Councillor Straw has been recommended as chair, and the entire council will serve as, the entire council as a whole will serve as the rest of the representatives of the committee. Is there a motion to appoint Councillor Straw as chair and the rest of the council as members of the finance committee? So moved. Councillor Randall, is there a second? Councillor Penny Jordan, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Item number 5-2019, the appointment of the Ordinance Committee. The caucus recommended Councillor Penny Jordan as chair and Councillors Caitlin Jordan and Valerie Randall as members. Is there a motion uh, for that appointment? So moved. Councillor Caitlin Jordan moved. Councillor Devereaux second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is also unanimous. Item number six, 2019, the appointments committee appointments. Councillor Devereaux has been recommended as chair and councillors Gabrielson and Straw as members. Is there a motion so in moved. favor of those appointments? So moved. Councillor Penny Jordan, is there a second? second. Councillor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Items number seven through 16 will be taken en bloc unless there's any objection. I'll be looking for a single motion to uh, approve the appointments of all of the representatives to the committees listed here, herein. Uh, is there a motion to uh, accept the appointments for items number seven through 16-2019 as presented here? So moved. Councillor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Councillor Penny Jordan, any discussion? All those in favor? That is unanimous. And item number, um, on that last item on number 16, I want to, um, though she's not here, thank uh, past Councilor Lennon for her continued service on the Comprehensive Plan Committee. Um, those of us that were here when we uh, organized the Comprehensive Plan Committee remember that um, Councillor Penny Jordan and Councillor Lennon at the time were selected because their terms would cover the duration of that work. Obviously, Councillor Lennon's 
um, term has expired, but she'll continue on that through the conclusion of that committee's work and uh, thank her for that. Um, item number 17-2019, the appointment of a fair hearing officer. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this agenda item? Seeing none. Um, the uh, council has before us a recommendation to reappoint David S. Sherman, former counselor and former counselor chair, to serve a second term as the fair hearing officer until December 31st, 2021. Is there a motion to accept that uh, appointment? Um. Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councilor Straw, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you to Mr. Sherman. Item number 18-2019, the appointment of the Registrar of Voters. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this agenda item? Seeing none, it's recommended that uh, Town Clerk Deborah Lane be reappointed to serve as Registrar of Voters for a term to expire January 1, 2021, and until a successor is appointed and sworn. Is there a motion to accept the recommended reappointment of Deborah Lane? So moved. Councillor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councillor Randall, any discussion? I would just like to thank you for your continued work in this regard. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other discussion, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 19-2019, the Code of Ethics. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none. Uh, the rules of the council uh, provide that we each need to um, attest to and then we will sign later uh, that we have read and understand the code of ethics to the town council, or for the town council, I should say. Um, do you want us to do that now? Or what's, what's, what's the recommended motion here? Um, Is to um, acknowledge the uh, code of ethics and okay. for councils to sign. And to adopt the code of ethics. To adopt it. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the code of ethics as included here in our agenda packet? So moved. Councilor Randall, seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. We'll sign that at the conclusion of the meeting. Um, Item number 20-2019 is our schedule of council meetings for 2019. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, listed here are the um, dates proposed for our regular and special meetings as well as workshops for the uh, uh, calendar, um, 2020, 2019 uh, calendar year as well as the budget schedule for fiscal 2020. Is there a motion to accept uh, the meetings as, meeting schedule as proposed? Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councillor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion about the schedule of meetings? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next item is number 21-2019, the appointments to boards and committees. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this item? I will introduce this item um, as there's nobody looking to speak to it. Um, uh, over the past several weeks, the appointments committee met um, several times to interview a number of highly qualified candidates uh, for vacancies on our various boards and committees. Um, we're very grateful for the um, uh, a, a high volume of interest and number of really qualified people that came forward. It's always great to have um, you know citizens that are interested in volunteering and giving of their time and talents on behalf of the town, so thank you very much. As is often the case, um, we had more interested people than we had uh, available openings to place people into. So uh, even if you weren't selected um, uh, or recommended for appointment, we thank you for your interest and hope that you'll continue to stay interested in future opportunities. Um, so with that, we have before us a slate of candidates to all of the boards and committees that are listed here. And I'll be looking for a recommendation um, to accept the, uh, I'm sorry, I'll be looking for a motion to accept the recommendation of the Appointments Committee uh, for all these appointments, most of which start beginning January 1, 2019. There are a handful um, that are people that are replacing um, vacated 
uh, uh, members of committees. And so those people will start uh, in those instances upon approval. So is there a motion? Um, I need to state oh. that my sister's name is on here, Carol Ann Jordan. Um, so do you want me to vote on all except hers or can I, how do you want to handle it? Um, does anybody have a concern about Councillor Jordan voting on a appointment for which her sister will serve or continue to serve uh, on that board? Yeah. Councillor Randall? I'm not concerned about um, her, her bias, but I think just in terms of appearance, it may make sense to vote on that item okay. separately. Yeah, I, if it wasn't sister, I think I would be, yeah. But right. I don't want it to be too busy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I will instead then be looking for a motion to accept the recommendations to all of the boards and committees with the exception of the planning board uh, that are listed here. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of these recommended appointments? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Um, I'll next be looking for a motion to, um, well, Councilor Jordan. To oh, I have to recuse myself, don't I? Do I? I think that's what we just established. Yes, <laughs> sorry, I'm here. As you stand aside, I'll be looking for a motion to accept the recommendations of the appointments to the planning board as listed here. So Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous, six nothing. Thank you very much. And thank you again to all of those people that came forward. Uh, we appreciate your uh, interest and look forward to working with you uh, with the council. Next up is item number 22-2019, the Bird Dog Roadhouse license. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none. Uh, the Bird Dog Roadhouse uh, has their uh, annual approval request here for their Malt, Venice, and Spiritus license uh, for the Cape Hospitality Group. Uh, is there a motion, or Deb, I'll check with you. Is there anything that you wanted to highlight in terms of your usual findings of fact as, uh, as just, it regards to this license? Just to let folks know that we um, uh, do follow our policy that we check with uh, fire police and codes with all our liquor licenses to see if there are any questions or concerns. Uh, there have not been uh, for this license, so staff would recommend approval. As Thank presented. you very much. Um, is there a motion to approve the Malt, Venus, and Spiritus license for Cape Hospitality Group doing business as Bird Dog Roadhouse at 517 Ocean House Road as presented here. So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Second that. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Uh, next item is number 23-2019, Senior Tax Relief Ordinance. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this item? Seeing none. Uh, recently we were presented by the tax assessor, um, the uh, program outline for the Senior Tax uh, Relief Program. Uh, that was uh, recommended. As part of that, we referred uh, to the ordinance committee, the item for them to draft language uh, to conform the program in our ordinances. Uh, they met on the 1st and 13th of November and at the meeting on the 13th, voted to recommend the ordinance to the town council for consideration. Our next step on this would be to refer this to a public hearing. So I'll be looking for a motion to refer the Senior Tax Relief Ordinance to public hearing on Monday, January 14th, 2019, at seven o'clock here at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall as part of our regular meeting that evening. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there any discussion? I did have a question. Go ahead. Um, I noticed the guidelines in the ordinance um, included income recommendations that apply to the household. Um, but the um, language for the applicant seemed to um, 
apply to an individual in the household, and I was just wondering if the intention was in a household where one member of the household is 65 and older, but others are not, that that individual will be able to apply, or if it meant to apply to households where all individuals were 65 plus. My, my understanding, it's household income. I, I, my, my question speaks more to the applicant, though. The, the applicant seems to be defined as an individual, but in the case right. where you have a, a household, for example, where you're filing jointly, the financial statements would likely list more than one individual. Right. One of whom may not meet the age eligibility requirement. Right. So I just wanted to one, make... Yeah, yeah, one has to. As long as one person meets the age right. requirement. But you're taking the total household income. So you could have four people living in the house, but the one person who meets the age is the one who's applying, but including all the household's income in their application. That was the way I read it. I just wanted to clarify that that was the intent of the ordinance. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to refer this to a public hearing on the 14th of January, 2019? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Item number 24-2019, a land donation uh, from a property at 44 Spurwink Avenue. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak at this point on this item? Seeing none, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt to introduce this for us, give us a little background. I, I, I can, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. This is a, uh the property that's at 44 Spurwink Avenue, currently owned by Colin Powers, it is. A, it's, he's looking to donate to the town part of the land that he owns. That's part of his property. It does. It would not make the lot a a non-conforming lot, so it'd still be a legal lot of record and meet the design of the the size requirements that you would have for a basic lot. Uh, but it does uh, abut uh, some town land. Uh, that uh, that has, I, I would say, environmental importance for for habitat, as well as uh, it's it's you know th that's the primary area. It was reviewed by the uh, conservation committee, and they had made a recommendation of four to zero to for the town to c to consider that. As uh, the council, you uh, have the powers to receive as well as to uh, as well as to uh, sell off uh, land like this, but uh, but ultimately. It comes down to what the council would like to do regarding this. The fact that it is a donation, I mean, there would be a, dimin a diminution of value, so there may be less property taxes, but that's really uh, beside the point when it comes to this. It's it's not exactly highly assessed at this point as well, uh, but it is. Uh, it would be a nice piece to have uh, for, for multiple different reasons. Thank and you. Maureen uh, O'Meara is here as well. If there are further questions as well as Councillor Gabrielson was I'm the chairman of the Conservation was Committee just at the same time. Councillor Gabrielson, to <laughs> yes. let us know uh, if you had anything to add. Um, no, it, it seems like a sensible um, thing for the town to accept the donation. There was some discussion uh, at the Conservation Committee about any um, legal fees that may arise from the transfer of title. I, I don't know if there's been any additional clarification since the time of the Conservation Committee meeting. Okay. No, no updates to that at this point in time. All right. It, it, it may be a small, a small amount, but it may be offset by the <coughs> value of the property that yep. we do receive, if there is some. Uh, so I'm looking for a motion. I, I have a oh. question. Uh, Go ahead. My question also would be the survey work, um, because it sounds like it's one piece of property that needs to be split. Who pays for that? Would, this, would we pay for that? Or the homeowner? How does that work? Go ahead. Uh, I know, I understand the, the, Mr. Powers has made some discussion about it as far as participating and if there was survey work that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, they're fairly straightforward legal descriptions on the lots. Uh, it's from an old, uh, from an old, um, you know. Plat map? Yeah, the old plat map. But probably what the basis, of, at least the original, uh, description that I saw showed it, referencing that, so it's part of the lots that would would come from that original parcel. It's, it's a combination of very small lots that that make up the majority of it. So there may be some survey work done, but we would we would have a discussion with Mr. Powers to see, you know, if, if it was a significant amount of money, then we would look at it. But I think it would be fairly low cost, but we could probably share in that. I would think it'd be a reasonable approach to take. 
My only other question is um, maintenance on the property. Is it something that needs a lot of maintenance or is it something that is basically is wetlands and? Probably be best forever wild. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, so I, I was also a little curious as to what our action is going to be tonight because it sounds like the actual land, uh, the meets and bounds is somewhat amorphous. So, uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing the motion. <laughs> uh, so are we looking for final approval or is it just start moving forward? Go ahead. If, if I may, perhaps, uh, rec if I may through the chair, recommend a uh, possible thought as far as the crafting of a motion. It may be to... Uh, charge or direct the manager to work with Mr. Powers uh, to come back with a meets and bounds description as well as a, a, a you know, clean definition as to what the town may be accepting uh, on this and then to bring, bring back in the future for, for final action by the council on acceptance. So moved. <laughs> I may. <laughs> Council Straw moves to affirm our interest in accepting the property and authorizing the town manager to work on the details with the property owner. Council Gabrielson seconds that motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Item number 25-2019, Sawyer Road Culvert Study. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none. Uh, in April of 2017, the town council authorized the application for a coastal communities grant to the main coastal program to assess 16 municipal culverts. Uh, this is part of a uh, ongoing program and uh, it is recommended here that the council accepts the Sawyer Road Hydrology and Hyd Hydraulic Study Grant in the amount of $32,124. Uh, further, it's recommended that we acknowledge the culvert assessment grant in the amount of $17,000. Matt or uh, town planner Maureen O'Meara, is there anything else that you wanted to add to provide context for this item? I will try, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Thank you. Uh, this, this is, as you can see, a collaborative grant between us and the town of, uh, town of Scarborough. Uh, specifically, this is to the area in the low-lying uh, section of Sawyer Road, just the on this side of the town line uh, where the water tends to, where the marsh tends to overtop the road. Uh, Scarborough obviously has an interest because the water will flow in one direction into Scarborough and then in another direction back into Cape Elizabeth. That's a substantial concern, but this is one area that I think we can uh, come up with a larger, larger long-term plan uh, for how to improve this situation by, by the use of this grant. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the uh, <coughs> grant in the amount of $32,124 and also acknowledge the uh, grant in the amount of $17,000? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 26-2019 is an update on the comprehensive plan review process. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, the comprehensive plan committee has completed their draft comprehensive plan. Thank you very much for all those that are involved in that work. It's a very um, important um, but also time consuming effort, so thank you very much. Um, is there a motion to set the review, the plan review process to workshop on Wednesday, December 19th, 2018 at 6 p.m.? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 27-2019, application of the planning board for a resource, resource protection permit. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, Matt, would you please introduce this item for us? I would be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. This is, uh, as you recall, phase one, which was completed last, uh, at the end of last summer, or, uh, or during last summer of the Hillway, Scott Dyer Road reconstruction took place. That was phase one. What we're looking at now is uh, phase two, which is, is 
part of this year's budget as well as we're looking to go out to bid on this. And this is the reconstruction of Scott Dyer Road from Patricia Drive up to Spurwink Avenue. Uh, the reason why this is phase two is because this would also uh, bring in part of the construction of a uh, sidewalk, which would then complete the sidewalk from the beginning of Scott Dyer Road to the end of, end of Scott Dyer Road. And that's part of the reason why uh, that and also the road uh, surface conditions down there is, is much uh, lower quality than it is in, the, in where phase three is. So, uh, but in the process of doing the design for this, it was discovered that there was about 1,500 square feet of wetland that as the road shifted in different directions as it, as it widened, we uh, were going to be stepping into uh, a little bit. Uh, so in order, to, in order to make that a legally uh, permissible encroachment on the resources, on the resource protection area, we went to the plan, or we're looking to go to the planning board uh, to get their approval. Uh, we did go to their workshop last week and it was fairly well received by the planning board, uh, but uh, we're kind of in an expedited process here because we're looking to go out to bid and then have bids back in January so we can get that work scheduled as well as having a better timing for uh, receiving bids for that type of work. It's, it's better to do it in January than it is to do it in June. Uh, so we're looking to get our pricing and get that planned ahead. And that's uh, why we're here. Uh, also, we need to have the approval of the council to authorize us to go forward to make that request at the planning board level. Very well, thank you. Is there a motion to authorize the application of the planning board for the resource protection permit that Matt just described? Second. Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? I have a question. Councilor Gabrielson. Um, am I correct in recalling that the, the culvert under the road was recently upgraded in this location and we're satisfied with the size of that crossing? So the, the intention with the sidewalk extension would be to extend a culvert of a similar size to the existing road crossing or is there some other structure that's envisioned or do we not know at this point? Oh, uh, if, if I may, thank you. Uh, yeah, those. I think those. I think there are two culverts. Those were replaced. I think three years ago, uh, more or less. And uh, their 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 size is perfect uh, for where it is. Uh, one one area that we're working on is getting uh, uh, some easements from a couple of abutting property owners to that uh, section of the road in order to have uh, for off shedding of you know basically some sheeting off of rainwater or a runoff from the road into that area. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, but but that. That's not part of the scope of the project. Uh, the part that we're looking at more along, along lines up towards uh, Councilor Jordan's end uh, by Mr. Delaquilla's, the intersection at that point, there's where the road kind of shifts a little bit to the right and it's a little bit narrower. So there's a little, there's like a little, I'd say a long triangle that comes along one section and then on the opposite side of the street there's another area. But, but no, that, that works well in conformance with what we're looking at here. I I have a yes, question, I, um, and I don't exactly know how to ask it. Um, as I read this, it's like we're going to be encroaching into wetlands, which then will have uh, potential, I mean, it's already runoff. What are the implications to those wetlands at this point in time? That's what I didn't get out of reading this. What are, what are the implications to the wetlands themselves? Very, very, very minor okay. uh, impact. I mean, it'll probably be you know, improved from where it is now, quite okay. frankly, um, with the way that the road will be crowned. And, and uh, it's also all within the right of way. Okay. Uh, so there's not additional land that we need to purchase or things along those lines, but but it'll probably be improving. But because of the fact that we are encroaching on it somewhat is the reason why we have to have re to, to be legal. Okay. Uh, okay. 20 years ago, you wouldn't have thought of it, but now because of the way, you know, the standards that we need to maintain, if you get close in order to be in, in conformance with the town standards, that's why uh, mm -hmm. we need to have it done. But it should, it, it'll be a vast improvement. I think of where we're at now. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number 28-2019, the acceptance of annual gifts and donations. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, included in the agenda packet tonight is a list of gifts that have been uh, given or donated to the town. 
Is there a motion to accept these gifts and donations for 2018? Councillor Devereaux, is there a second? I'll second. Councillor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you very much for all of those gifts. They are accepted with great appreciation. Uh, item number 29-2018, the finance director position. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, last year you'll remember that as part of our um, budget discussions, we had a lot of uh, conversation about the inclusion of a new position of finance director. Matt's been working on that and has presented us with a draft job description here, as well as funding recommendation. Matt, would you like to talk about this item? Thank you, Chairman Garvin, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, as you recall, uh, to, uh, Councilor Strom may recall this better than most, uh, at, the, at the end of the budget season, uh, there was discussion about adding that finance director position to the but to the current budget. Uh, at the time, I felt it was good. Uh, it would be good for us to have a longer discussion, which we ended up having at the council level in July and uh, over the summer and early part of the fall. We worked on crafting this new uh, the position description, reaching out to other communities that are similarly situated, such as uh, Falmouth and Yarmouth, and looking at what you know for example, to look at their position descriptions and to see uh, how they worked. Uh, I also had the opportunity to discuss the, this concept with Superintendent Wolfram, as right now our, our current situation is the business office and Catherine Mesber as our business manager uh, provides many of those services, as well as Deborah Lane uh, does many of these functions as well, as well as myself do a number of these functions. Uh, so. Uh, as these budgets get larger, uh, reporting levels get greater, uh, the requirements and uh, the technical nature of this business uh, grows. Uh, I started to look deeper and deeper into this, the, the descriptions as well as looking at the uh, our current level of services and found that uh, it's very supportable to, at least from my end, to look at uh, the viability of a finance director. Speaking with Superintendent Wolfram, uh, looking at the structures, how we would think about imp implementing this type of position uh, and discussion on, this, on the school budget side of it, uh, found that the school still, by their, by their legal requirements, would have to maintain their, an independent business manager. So uh, that would be Catherine, Catherine's position. There would be some changes, obviously, where the roles and responsibilities that are assigned from the town level of work would would go into this position, uh, so that would, and, and, and to be honest, I, I think her strengths are really on the school side of it much more, and she'd be the first to say that because her background up to this point was in was in the school atmosphere. Uh, so I looked at that and tried to look at all the different duties that that this position would have to provide uh, for the town, and then summarize it into this different job description. The thought would be that uh, this person would be a direct report to me as a department head, but then would also be located downstairs on the first floor uh, to, in order to work with the tax office staff, reconciling uh, you know, their work on a daily basis, you know, functions that Debbie does now, as well as looking at the town payroll, reporting, working with the auditors, uh, reconciling the bank statements on a monthly basis, uh, as well as the other it, well, you can see by the description that I have, it's fairly uh, well-defined roles and responsibilities that we're trying to, trying to get this position to do. Uh, my desire would be to try to advertise this towards the end of the year if the council would uh, allow me to go in that direction and then try to get the, this person on board within the first month and have them ready to roll at the start of the budget season so we could then, uh, you know, consistent with other areas that uh, Councilor Straw and I and the council had discussed as well the level of, um, like, for lack of a better term, level of sophistication that we could place in our budget uh, could be improved as well as some of the other uh, different styles that they're currently used in the budgetary process and could help us, I think, in, in, as we grow, I think this position could provide, provo could provide us a better product as well as, you know, quite honestly, free, free some time for other staff, uh, roles and responsibilities that I, you know, may not be my specialty, may not be Deb's specialty, uh, this may be this person's specialty, as well as the, the work that Debbie has to do from, uh, you know, from the clerk's side of it, uh, it's not getting any lighter. I think she, 
she doesn't complain, but I know it's a lot. There's a lot there as well. So if we could free up that as well as uh, some of the roles that, that the manager needs to do, as well as quite honestly, when you look at the fact that we have just under a forty million dollar budget, of which twelve of it is the town and twenty eight is the school, uh, I think we're at the point that it may be wise to have that level of sophistication and professionalism on that. And that's why I brought this forward this evening. Uh, what I would be looking at after I, you know, I've got an idea as to what the ticket looks like as far as uh, what that position would cost us through the, through the, through the year. Um, but I would come back with a recommendation next month to, as far as, uh, you know, what that number would be. Uh, we'd probably be looking at unassigned fund balance would be the way to, to, to fund it throughout the end of the year. So are you looking for a motion from us to approve the creation of the position? Yes, yeah, if okay. we could this evening, and then I would come back with a, with a recommendation next month if, you know, if, if, six, if we get through the process successfully uh, to have a recommendation to fund the position at X amount of dollars. Got it. I mean, we're roughly looking at the 80 to $90,000 to 90, range for that type of position. Uh, it's consistent with what other uh, communities are at, but we'd be looking at roughly half that. Okay. So is there a motion uh, to recommend the creation of the finance director position as Matt just described and uh, authorize him to go forward with the uh, recruitment for said position? So moved. Councilor Straw. Is there a second? <laughs> Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? Can Council I, okay. do we want to ask questions on this yet? I think we're going to in the discussion right now, so. Cool. Councilor Straw? <laughs> I, I, I yield to uh, Councilor Jordan. Councilor Penny Jordan. Okay, I, um, number one, I think you did a, a, a really good job. This is pretty comprehensive. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and I believe it would fit under knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, investment analysis. Um, I did, I, you know, I looked at this in several different ways. Are we, are we going to want the person to be in tune to our investment portfolio as well, or, uh, or not? Thank you. Uh, quite frankly, I think. They can come forward with recommendations, but I ultimately think we'll rely on the folks who currently make make our recommendations. Right, for we us. have we can have consultants, but yeah. normally any um, business entity has people who also are uh, in tune to investment, so you can kind of have a dialogue versus teacher tell stuff. So um, that would be my I I would think having somebody who's in tune financially as to. Uh, Investments. What's what our portfolio is looking like? Yada yada yada. Those kind of things. No, I, I definitely think that would be part of the function, uh, as well, as well as with myself at that point. Uh, we, we, that's what we've done over the past year as well. When we were looking at uh, CDs and other different, you know, different low risk investments that the town has, but with, uh, like People's United, for instance, who we do a lot of our uh, work with, like as as a bond would mature, or mm -hmm. uh, we would. We'd be reaching out to the, you know, the different banks to see what we could get for better returns on, and different rates. So that's what we did this past year on, on some of those, as well as working with, you know, uh, our different investment advisors, but trying to make sure that we were in the best position to do. So that'd be part. That'd still be part of my function as well as working with that person as as we've done historically. I have like four other questions. Do you want to oh, give it, or do ahead. you want me to keep rolling? Okay. Um, the other thing had to do with people management. I see it uh, kind of uh, implied here and there, but I think sometimes we need to start strengthening people management skills. It's not just the ability to organize and direct and supervise staff. I really think uh, we seek people to build uh, high performance teams. And um, I, I think the person who comes to the table, when I look at uh, three years experience in supervision when I, I consider uh, what we're going to be expecting of this person, they may need more than three years experience in supervising a function such as this. 
because uh, this is this is comprehensive. This is really intense stuff. Um, so I think they got to come to the table with not just five years experience of you know being able to do the work themselves, but to really be able to create a team that we're looking for. Okie doke. Um, and then the other one that I had is um, key trigger points. Another uh, thing that I think about um, whether it fit under, it's, it's alluded to under job functions, but it's all those trigger points from a risk management perspective because they should be looking um, two to three, to, we're seeing trends here, we're seeing trigger points that we can risk manage up front as a council. So the more that we we can learn trends and things like that. So I think uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities, we need to have trigger points or whatever you might use it as from a risk management perspective. Um, and then the other thing is asset monitoring. One of the things that I see is we have a lot of assets in this town, whether it be buildings or computers or whatever. And what I've seen in the past is does everything have a little number on it that we truly know what all our assets are? Is this job going to be responsible for ensuring a, uh, a process is put in place in order that we know have a full scope of our assets, or will that is that the responsibility of somebody else? Yeah, uh, this would be under their area. It, it currently is that function now at the business office. Uh, I will say that the town side we take our asset management very seriously. Uh, we, um, we have I could show you the reports we have with uh, Maine Municipal on an annual basis, but we go through that list continuously to, to update it. If we have something brand new, once, I mean, quite honestly, when the budget was approved this this year, uh, I had assets. The municipal know, budget, On correct? the municipal side, yes. This exactly. is and going to this would be their responsibility. span multiple departments, correct? Oh, sure, as it, do, as it does now. Yeah, as it does now, we'll, we'll continue that, but but yeah, it'll end up being their, their universe, whereas now, uh, it's under the school and the, the town side. But, you know, because Maine Municipal rides hurt on us extremely close on that, that's why we make sure we identify things as they come in, up to a certain threshold, obviously, but, but we do it now as well. But no, those are all great recommendations. Thank you. Councilor uh, Great list. Um, the, take it back to the, the, the gating question, so just to confirm that we're not trying to push a staff member on you that you don't necessarily want or need, uh, in light of your review and consideration of the position and talking to the other neighboring towns and cities, uh, is your final conclusion that yes, it's, we are at the point now, the budget's of a size, the, the population of the town is such and the revenue streams are such that it is warranted to have a full-time position? Completely. Great. Yeah, I, I think this is the right time and the right place. Uh, I, I will say that I took some ribbing from other managers who said Mike never needed that. <laughs> uh, you know, they said it tongue in cheek, but it was more, uh, you know, at the, the level of what you need to, re to report now and uh, the different areas of concerns. And, I, and honestly, I think that uh, there is more than enough work to support the position and to, and to get that done, as well as alleviating uh, stress on other departments that currently, you know, are, are feeling it as well. So I think we can definitely improve where we're at, and I, I support it. I would point out, too, that on multiple occasions last year, our um, external auditors highlighted the fact that Cape Elizabeth is by far an outlier town um, among those in the area and, and peer size communities for not having that role. So, uh, and, and when I say peer size, I mean, um, uh, you know, the total total budget um, under management and things like that. So it's unusual uh, for a community with a budget of ours to not have somebody in this role. If, if I may, in, yep. in furtherance of that point, speaking with Jen Connors from RKO this afternoon, when I informed her that this was going to be on the council agenda this evening, uh, <laughs> she was uh, <laughs> she positively enforced uh, or endorsed it as well. So she thought it was a great idea and was a happy. I was glad to hear that because she, she was the opinion that we, we did need it as well. Other questions or discussion? Matt, can you just 
so everybody's click. Can you, can you just walk back through again the relationship of this position to the school department, please? The, the word I'm thinking of is parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, count, the, the, the town would have our finance director, comptroller, the, the school would have their business manager. Uh, they would share responsibilities with, you know, like, quite honestly, the, like, uh, like Angel, who's our accounts payable person, our payroll person, Denise, and Arlene would still stay on the town side. So we would have some, you know, we have some crossover there, but this person would be more responsible for the town's uh, uh, ledger, I guess would be a better way to put it, but they would be, they would be comparable positions. Uh, the way that the structure is legally, we can, we, if we put a person who's going to be over the business manager, they'd end up having to be an employee of the school mm -hmm. because they need to have that direct uh, connection between the superintendent and the business manager. Uh, the town side is not as rigorous, quite frankly. Uh, but uh, I look at this and say, okay, I mean, we need someone who has specifically municipal finance related skills. and. But they would, they would be, you know, you hate to say it, but they're two silos. Although they, there is some crossover that happens because we would work on, you know, sharing payroll, sharing accounts payable. We'd have those folks who would still do that work, but uh, they would still be under the management of the, of the school side. So this role would have no function in preparation or direction of the school budget when it comes to us. Um, would you envision? Or, or let me ask you a different way. What would you envision in the way of any informal collaboration on those things, even though there isn't direct repertorial, you know, structure in that regard? It's it's still. I mean, we are still a small organization, so there would be that. I, th I think there would be that collaboration that would take place. Uh, we're, we're doing some of that now with our capital planning. Uh, we're trying to get the school uh, to increase you know, their their level of. Uh, Awareness with capital planning. Uh, I know Penny was had, was having some discussions on the comp plan side of it uh, to try to have that as part of a larger comprehensive reporting that we have for the town's long-term capital needs, regardless if you're in the town side or the school side. So there is going to be that collaboration that would take place, and as far as looking at probably financial challenges. So I think the two would interact, uh, much as the superintendent and I interact as well. Okay. Um, Councilor. As I think about what you're describing, and you think about it from kind of an, an organization work process perspective, um, one of the things that I kept feeling from the uh, business office manager during our budgeting process is uh, wanting some level of uh, support. And, and maybe support's the wrong word, but um, uh, a, a sense of, of team around that that's a very complex budget and and it's very complex from a monitoring and uh, perspective as well as you know accounts payables receivables etc uh, will this person be able to offer uh, support and expertise in how to maybe uh, streamline some of those processes because that's another feeling I got during the budget process last year is there there was there was some kludginess around the systems uh, that we have from an automated systems perspective as well as Excel spreadsheets being used um, will this person be able to offer how might we move away from some of those things that create angst for the uh, business manager if I may, it, Council Jordan, I think that's a that's a good question. Uh, obviously, when you come in to use a whole new uh, and to learn a new software program, is, it has its challenges. And I think uh, that was part of the challenge that uh, the business office had as a new user, uh, trying to get up to speed on that, as well as trying to learn municipal accounting. And, uh, and so I think that, that that was a really tough challenge to try to overcome. Uh, and I think she's done a good job, mm -hmm. really, she to, has done to move a good forward job. on that. Right. And, uh, but I think the two, yeah, I think the two would have to work together to try to streamline the process. I think we've had, you know, we've had some changes in personnel up there. Uh, you know, Kathy Maxwell's moved downstairs to help. You know, she's our deputy clerk. Uh, Denise Porciello has come on board. I think she's brought a different perspective as well. So, and she's been a great addition to that mm -hmm. team. So I think that. 
you know, that as a unit could work very well together to have, you know, almost taking some of the pressure off from looking at the municipal side of it. So they may have the freedom to focus on some of their areas, but also the strength of that additional position and the experience to try to, to, to basically do that work. And that, would, that should come second nature. Uh, Denise, for instance, who came from, you know, she was working in a larger town in Connecticut, lived in Scarborough, who, and we hired her to come to work on board here. She was plug and play. I mean, she's been a great addition to the team. So, uh, so seeing how fast she came on board and learned that and, and did that, I can see that if we had that, like I guess you could say that infusion of new talent would I think be a, would be a strength to the overall organization, but also complementary to the school side as well. And I think it'll help us. I think what I'm hearing, what I agree with, is that I hope that there is benefit to be reaped from the school department, even though this will be a municipal position. And um, while there might not be organizationally any kind of formal or even sort of dotted line reporting structure, that um, somehow we're able to establish some good sharing of best practices and knowledge sharing. And I know we've talked about um, both you and the superintendent, the school board chair, council chair, finance chairs for both meeting regularly. I would assume that this person would you know, probably be party to, to those types of meetings too. So anyway, going forward, I hope that that's you know, um, something that we'd be able to Can see. Can I just say this. one more thing? Go ahead. And, and I only need to say this because I don't want anybody to think that I was questioning anybody's abilities. I just got a sense that, uh, I, that we have a really good employee in our town uh, who who does great work, who seemed to want to have some um, somebody who understands that financial world as well as she does. So to bounce ideas off people is really good. So it's no reflection on anybody. It's that I want her to feel um, supported. That's the bottom line from my perspective. If, if I may as well. Yep. I think your comments are spot on, uh, I, and I, I agree with you completely. And it's not a question of that, as well. It's really a question of graduating to that level of what we need for uh, to make that function where it needs to. And they are two different languages. I mean, uh, municipal accounting and the educational reporting and the educational accounting are—they are Greek and Latin. You know, it's a, it's, yep. there, it's a challenge, and, uh, and I think we've, we've done well with that for a long time, but it's, I think it's at the point that we could, we could do better. Mm -hmm. And it's not down talking to current staff, it's just that's where the world has moved to. Great. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on anything that was not on tonight's agenda before we adjourn? <laughs> Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Councillor Gabrielson, is there a second? Second. Councillor Penny Jordan, all those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. We have the